Welcome back to Scale Model Kit Review. This is your host, Steve. I am in San Francisco, and today we are taking a tour of Alcatraz. I'll be right back. Stay tuned. United States Penitentiary, Alcatraz Island. You are entitled to food, clothing, shelter, and medical attention. Anything else that you get is a privilege. Rule number five, Alcatraz Inmate Regulations. Alcatraz soon came to play a major role in the federal government's overdue response to organized crime. If gangsters such as Al Capone and Machine Gun Kelly were symbols of the nation's lawlessness, then Alcatraz? Alcatraz would be the nation's symbol for punishing the lawless. In this respect, gangsters and Alcatraz were perfect partners in a common tragedy. Two iconic extremes on a collision course. American gangsters' celebrity status set the stage for the birth of a unique detention concept. Aside from military prisons, the federal government did not establish its own penitentiaries until 1891, which meant that those convicted of federal crimes were incarcerated in state and local jails. In the late 1800s, the number of federal prisoners housed in these institutions was significant. As an example, in January 1877, 22 of the 29 inmates housed at Greystone, the Alameda County Jail located in Pleasanton, California, were federal convicts. Later that year, things changed when Congress made it illegal for states to hire or contract out the labor of federal prisoners housed in their institutions. Up to this point, the federal inmates had cost the states little or nothing, since the prisons benefited financially from inmate labor. To offset operating costs after the new laws came into force, state facilities began charging the federal government to maintain federal inmates. By the early 1900s, these charges ran from 30 to 50 cents per day per inmate. In 1891, Congress authorized construction of three federal prisons. The first of these would be at Fort Leavenworth, Kansas. Leavenworth, which had originally been a military fortress, was taken over by the Department of Justice in 1895. A second federal prison opened in Atlanta in 1902 and the third a converted territorial jail on McNeil Island in Washington's Puget Sound. Then, on May 27, 1930, the Congress authorized the establishment of the Federal Bureau of Prisons, BOP, within the Department of Justice. It is hereby declared to be the policy of the Congress that the said institutions be so planned and limited in sizes as to facilitate the development of an integrated federal penal and correctional system which will assure the proper classification and segregation of federal prisoners according to their character, the nature of the crime they have committed, their mental condition, and such other factors as should be taken into consideration in providing an individualized system of discipline, care, and treatment of the persons committed to such institutions. A New Super Prison on October 12, 1933, the Justice Department announced plans to convert Alcatraz to a maximum security, minimum privilege federal prison. USP Alcatraz Island officially came into being on January 1, 1934. As a federal super prison, Alcatraz served the dual purpose of incarcerating the nation's most notorious criminals in a restrictive, disciplined environment and acting as a visible warning that the federal government meant business. Additionally, the BOP strictly controlled every piece of information released to the press, so part of the punishment for the more infamous inmates was to never again see their names in print. Once they were locked up at Alcatraz, they were completely isolated from the public. The BOP was in firm control of every aspect of their daily lives. Break the laws of society, and you go to prison. Break the prison rules, and you go to Alcatraz. The citizens of San Francisco bitterly resented the BOP's decision to concentrate the nation's worst criminals in the middle of scenic San Francisco Bay. 
Several public campaigns tried to block the transition, but all were unsuccessful. The Department of Justice called upon patriotic Americans to support the nation's war against crime through the establishment of Alcatraz and assured the residents that the prison would be designed as an escape-proof fortress, which it said would completely eliminate any threat that might be posed to escaped prisoners. Several officials had a hand in planning this new facility, including BOP Director Sanford Bates, Assistant Director James V. Bennett, Attorney General Homer Cummings, and James A. Johnston, formerly warden at San Quentin State Prison and soon to be the first warden of USP Alcatraz. In his 1949 memoir, Alcatraz and the Men Who Live There, Johnston wrote, I assumed office on January 2nd, 1934, hour after hour, day after day. I walked back and forth, up and down, and around the island. From the dock to the administration building, from the office to the powerhouse, powerhouse to the shops, shops to the barracks, into the basements, up on the roofs, across the yards, through the tunnels. I sent more suggestions to Washington. One of the nation's foremost security experts, Robert Berge, was commissioned to redesign Alcatraz into an escape-proof facility. Berge's basic concept was to fully restrict inmate movement. No longer would prisoners be able to move freely around the island, but rather would be confined to the main cell house, with passage to the industries building as required. Those coming into the cell house area had to pass through several electronically controlled gates operated by correctional officers stationed in the armory. From this control center, the officer on duty had a clear view through a rectangular two-inch thick bulletproof glass portal. The sally port, or first gate lock, featured electronically manipulated sliding steel plates, which shielded the key slot. The armory officer was the only person with access to the slide panel. Only the shield was opened. The officer used a key to manually open the gate. There were then two more gates to pass through before entering the cell house. This would become the hallmark of Alcatraz. Security safeguards, created by layers upon layers of redundancy. Under the terms of the transfer agreement, Alcatraz would continue to provide laundry services to the U.S. Army, as well as several other support services. The Army transferred title to nearly all of the industry equipment and entered into a long-term agreement to provide fresh water delivery, which they did for the next 30 years. When the Army finally vacated the island on June 19, 1934, they left behind 32 men who were serving time for breaking military law. These men became the first of USP Alcatraz's inmate population. In April 1934, the work began to make the island and the prison building more secure. The BOP contracted with Stewart Ironworks Company of Cincinnati, Ohio to install what were at the time state-of-the-art security systems. Correctional officers would be able to open or close each cell or group of cells in full view of the gun gallery officer through the use of pull levers installed at the end of each cell block. Cells in B and C block had their flat, soft steel barred doors replaced with modern case-hardened steel bars. Electricity was routed into each cell and utility tunnels were cemented closed to prevent the inmates from entering or hiding in them. Toolproof bars shielded all areas, such as windows, that could be accessed by inmates. And at each end of the main cell block, elevated and barred gun galleries gave correctional officers a clear view of inmate activities and allowed them to protect the unarmed officers on duty on the cell house floor. Special tear gas canisters installed in the ceiling of the dining hall could be remotely activated from both the gun gallery and outside observation points. Electromagnetic metal detectors were positioned outside the dining hall and on prison industry access paths. The prisoners referred to these devices as snitch boxes or mechanical stool pigeons. Guard towers were strategically positioned around the island's perimeter. During the military era, the cell blocks were numbered one through six, with each side considered a separate entity. As part of the BOP plan, the cell blocks were given letters A, B, C, and D. Block A, Army Block 1, and D, Army Block 6, were not retrofitted, since only B and C, Army Blocks 2, 3, 4, and 5, were slated to house the main prison population. Each 150-foot-long cell block comprised three tiers with 28 cells to a tier. The cells were 9 feet deep, 5 feet wide, and a little more than 7 feet high, and each contained a cot with a sleeping mattress approximately 5 inches thick, 
blankets, a small work table, a toilet, water for which was piped in from the bay, a sink that supplied fresh water, and a shelf that could be used for the inmate's personal effects. None of the cells adjoined a perimeter wall. If an inmate were able to tunnel his way through the cell wall, he would still need to find a way to escape from the prison itself. In the middle of each cell block was a utility corridor through which ran plumbing and ventilation ducts. Inmates called the cross aisle at the front of the prison, Pekin Place. This was the visiting area, which consisted of four small bulletproof windows with small partitions. Inmates sat on the cell house side of the window and relatives or other authorized guests on the public side. Directly across at the opposite end of the cell house was Times Square, so named because of a large wall-mounted clock that hung at the base of the West Gun Gallery. Guard Towers Initially, six watchtowers were constructed as tactical lookouts. The dock tower was located at the north end of the dock area. The officer assigned to this post warded off vessels that failed to maintain a minimum 200-yard distance and was also keeper of the keys to the prison launch. The main tower was sited on the northeast corner of the prison's building's roof. During its 17 years of operation, it was maintained 24 hours a day. The main tower was removed in 1951. Had it been left in place, this tower would likely have prevented the famous 1962 Morris and Anglin brothers' escape. The powerhouse tower was located on the northeast end of the island, adjacent to the powerhouse. It was eventually abandoned when the dock tower was rebuilt to a higher elevation. The model shop tower was built on the rooftop of the Model Industries building and was staffed only during daylight work hours. The hill tower was located between the prison's recreation yard and the industries building and a long catwalk ran from the recreation yard wall to the model shop building. This tower was positioned to allow the officer on duty to provide assistance to officers posted at these locations. The road tower was accessed by a catwalk leading from the prison yard catwalk and was isolated by a barbed wire cyclone gate in the middle of the walkway. Most of the tower posts had their own toilets and running water. Nevertheless, officers considered these posts to be the worst assignments of any on the island. Former captain of the guard, Philip Burgeon, who was assigned to Alcatraz from 1939 until 1955, once commented, there was nothing worse than being assigned to a tower or on the yard wall. I had that duty on a number of occasions and it was hell. Your lips and skin were always chapped from exposure and the cold metal of your gun would numb your hands. Tower assignments were typically cold and extremely boring. Radios, considered a dangerous diversion, were strictly prohibited. Tower officers were well-armed and each post had its own weapon configuration. The weapons used include Thompson submachine guns, powerful .30-06 Springfield rifles, Colt 45 pistols, gas guns, and gas grenades. Former correctional officer Alver Bloomquist recalled his assignment on the road tower. At night it was freezing cold and if the fog was thick enough it had a very eerie feeling. You couldn't see anything when the night fog shrouded the island and I can still remember hearing the deafening screams of the seagulls that would startle the hell out of you. It always made you a little nervous, especially after knowing that those desperate inmates had rushed Stites, an officer assigned to the model shop tower during 1938, during an escape attempt. When they finally gave me a day assignment in the industries, I can remember never being happier. I used to think that this, well this, this was worse than being locked up in one of those cells. Walk, do not run when moving from one place to another. I'm Pat Mahoney, former Alcatraz Correctional Officer, and I'll be your guide. I served seven years on the rock. These first photos introduce some of my fellow officers. I am Philip Bergen, Captain of the Guards, United States Penitentiary, Alcatraz, California. Well, my name is George DeVincenzi. I used to play checkers with Robert Stroud. I don't think I ever beat him. <laughs> uh, my name is Ronald Battles. I asked whether they hired blacks out there. You know how it was in the 50s. Yeah, my name is uh, Leon Whitey Thompson. My number was 1465. I was a man that had total hatred in them days. I hated anything that walked to crawl on this earth. I was a man 
He was dead inside. You couldn't hurt me no more, see? I'm John Banner. My Alcatraz number was 1133. I'm a thief, you know. I ended up about number 17 or something like that on the most wanted. You were a number, you weren't a name. You want to be a human. I wasn't Jim Quill, and hell, I was number 586. Number, you weren't a name. Everybody wants to be an individual. They want to be a human. And you weren't at the rock. My name is Darwin Kuhn, number 1422. Figured I'm never going to get out. Yeah, I'm going to sit right here until I die. Walk through the cutoff. The Alcatraz cell house opened as a federal prison in 1934. Within these walls lived the country's toughest, most dangerous, and most famous prisoners. As soon as you exit the cutoff, immediately turn right onto the next quarter. It's called Broadway. Broadway was the first stop for arriving prisoners. We went right down Broadway, you know, in our birthday suits. <laughs> and all the guys, you know, howling. And... Well, here's a typical Alcatraz cell. Every one of them in the cell house is exactly like. I had a metal tabletop and a little chair there, and that was about it. The cell was pretty barren. Five feet wide. Nine feet long and seven feet high. That's what I call a little box. No decorations allowed. Anything couldn't paste anything on the wall. Waiting on the bed for each new prisoner was a copy of the official rules and regulations. This is the rules of the cell house. Your cell is subject to search at any time. Your towel had to be folded up and put on your shelf. Your toothbrush and they used to give us tooth powder in little green containers. I guess like a cockroach feels in a matchbox. You may smoke in your cell in the library. We were issued a pack of wings on a Monday, a Wednesday, and a Friday. Every inmate, whether he smoked or not. Sweep your cell and place the trash in the trash bag. I knew every mark, everything in that cell. And pretty soon that cell became like a part of me. Or I became a part of the cell. Right. Alcatraz is always classed as the end of the line, the point of no return. It was like going into the ground, you know, when you're buried, you're gone forever. This is the rules of the cell house. Your cell is subject to search at any time. Prisoners had a decision to make, whether to obey the rules or not, to do good time or bad time. That decision affected their lives dramatically. An inmate is given housing, good food, medical attention, and all the necessities of life. Everything else was a privilege. Time to exercise outside. Getting books and mail all had to be earned. One of their favorite privileges was the recreation yard. The most pleasant place, I believe, on Alcatraz and the most appreciated. The handball court, the horseshoe court. The Prisoners court. also played bridge out in the yard. They used dominoes instead of cards. And they came out with a system called auto bridge. You played it all by yourself. Guys got so wound up in this bridge thing that they ate and slept it. They'd go out there when it would be so cold that you didn't think you could stay out there, yet they'd stay out there for three hours and play bridge. And if you're occupied with bridge and you're studying bridge, you're not thinking about going over the wall. Prisoners who chose not to behave ended up in a harsher place, isolation. D Block was a prison within Alcatraz, the treatment unit. This place is gonna operate on the basis that you do what you're told and you're gonna get a fair break. You don't behave yourself, we're gonna come down on you like a ton of bricks. Unruly or violent prisoners were sent here. They stayed in their cells 24 hours a day. Typically, they were only allowed out once a week 
for a shower and exercise. Now in this cell block, we have 42 of the least popular cells in Alcatraz. Although by far they are the best, the roomiest, and the nicest state-of-the-art cells that were available in this prison. It was cold, it was damp. The wind used to just blow through there. You could hear, it. at night you could hear it whistling through the window. One of the more infamous prisoners to live here in D Block was convicted killer Robert Stroud, the so-called Birdman. And almost immediately upon his arrival at Alcatraz, he was relegated to the uh, treatment unit. And he didn't bring his birds along with him, which made him very unhappy. Alvin Carpus, you gotta watch out for him, former public enemy number one. Creepy Carpus. When you seen Creepy, you wouldn't have to be told he was creepy because he walked on his toe. He had Kelly. Machine gun Kelly. Nice fella, never give you any troubles at all. Very accommodating, polite. Mickey Cohen, Frankie Garbo. And uh, Capone. And a fool with Capone, see? He was a street fighter. He was a big man, he was in good shape. The only thing, his brain was gone. He had syphilis. Well, eventually it drove him crazy. When the cell was occupied, the regulations required that the light be on. Well, we kept the lights off when they were in there. They were in the dark. Well, when I'd go in the hole, what I used to do was I'd tear a button off my coveralls. I'd flip it up in the air. Then I'd turn around in circles. Then I'd get down on my hands and knees and I'd hunt for that button. Then when I found the button, Stand up, I do it again. But if you would close your eyes, like right now, close your eyes and seal your eyes up with your hand, with a little concentration, you can see a light. And pretty soon that light will get brighter. And you've got to concentrate on this. And after a while, not a short while, this takes time and practice, but pretty soon you can almost put your own TV there. And you can see things, and you can go on trips, and this is what I did. This was a prison library. You put your request on a library card. If the book was available, they'd bring it and put it in the bars for you. Prisoners with reading privileges could subscribe to approved magazines. And if it had some story about some convict out of Nebraska or something that was cut out, never mind that you might have been reading a serial and it was on the back of one of them pages. Prisoners who behaved could also take correspondence courses. I took a course from the University of Pennsylvania on animal husbandry. The gestation period for a pig is uh, three months, three weeks, and three days. <laughs> three times a day, all the men in general population gathered here for 20-minute meals. Imagine 200-plus men, each armed with a knife, fork, and spoon. This was potentially the most dangerous room in the cell house. I think about three, four men got killed with kitchenware. At the end of three decades, over 1,500 men had served time on the rock. By then, Alcatraz had served its own time. After years of harsh wind and weather, the buildings were badly deteriorated. The isolated island was too expensive to run. And now in the 1960s, prison reformers preached rehabilitation instead of punishment. Early in 1963, Attorney General Robert F. Kennedy ordered Alcatraz closed. 